as Mark said, a little bit about myself. And I'm not trying to be Madonna here, who talked about herself incessantly in her tribute to Aretha Franklin. Um, but it does probably bear a little bit of background uh, to know sort of what my perspective is. Um, I kind of got into this industry by accident a while ago at Brown University, where I co-founded the Scholarly Technology Group with Alan Unier, who you might know now as the uh, Dean of uh, UIUC Information School. Um, and there we provided advanced uh, research support, computing support to researchers uh, for a number of years. And um, my experience there was formative, but I, I, I have to admit I got a little bit tired of it. And, um, and when I left Brown, I, I left in sort of, a, 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 I went as far as away as possible from academia. I joined a management consultancy. Um, and, um, and so I've got sort of two very broad views of uh, the way systems work, uh, the way organizations work, and so on and so forth. And they inform a lot of this and inform a lot of my prejudices uh, here. Um, I should also just say this is Alaska's birthday. And generally, birthdays are supposed to be celebrations and happy occasions and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm usually not asked to come and just be happy. Um, I have this very weird role. I have no idea how I do it. All my friends ask me, what do I do? And I say, well, people invite me places. And I give talks. And I, I basically insult them. And then they keep inviting me back. And I have no idea why. I hope they, it continues. It's a nice gig. Um, I am going to talk about, I was asked to talk about the industry and my perspective on the industry. And clearly we've had a lot of successes in this particular community. I mean, coming into this with the, you know, Plan S uh, being talked about is such a, such a change from the first meeting I attended, which was in Lund, where everybody was just trying to figure out how they were going to get any attention uh, whatsoever. So gigantic change there. This is great. But I'm not going to let you rest on your laurels. I'm going to talk about a few problems that I see uh, in particularly, well, the industry broadly, but also this community. Um, and then I hope um, that at the end I actually give you some sort of positive directions. The title I picked for this, some people have asked me about it, uh, is actually an internet meme, if you don't know it. It's a kind of old one. Um, but it refers to a series of pictures that people have posted where people, where the caption is always, there, I fixed it. And it's things like this. <laughs> right? There, I fixed it. And it's things like this. I don't know whether you can see that. The sign on the top says hot tub. That's a burning garbage pail and that's like a, like a, you know, a, a rubber, uh, you know, garden pool. Uh, or this one, which seems a little more appropriate. <laughs> and, um, and the point of this is that sometimes in trying to fix things, we bodge things, right? Um, and perhaps we actually make them a little worse and a little uglier. And I just, I have to back up and say this site is a source of, uh, of amusement. It does verge a little bit on the sort of poverty porn thing, so it can get ugly. Um, you have to be selective in looking at it. Um, but, you know, I will say I do these things sometimes myself. You know, I'm gonna, I, just, I just have to get this thing running and a lot of duct tape and wire later, I've got something and it looks vaguely like this. Um, so that's the cloudy bit, right? So I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think we've done. Um, and we've done them, we've done them for tactical reasons. We've done them probably to, you know, achieve short-term gains. Um, but ultimately, we really have to think about whether they're worth continuing and whether we actually want to change our focus. And I, I do promise you I'll get into the detail. And as I said, at the, at the end, I'm going to try and sort of, um, you know, suggest a direction where we can go and suggest some things that we can do. Um, and I hope that I'm invited back first. Um, and secondly, that in a few years, you know, we're all going in this direction. I already am hopeful because I think yesterday's talks uh, already indicated that we're going in some of the directions that I think are important. Okay? So, what I plan to do here, right, because I was given this remit, talk about the industry, and one of the problems is that I had to kind of listen to what everybody was saying to get a good sense of where the industry, in particular this group, was before I could actually 
um, summarize everything. So I had this gigantic presentation, you know, talking about every bloody thing on earth that, you know, could possibly, I, that I thought might come up here. Um, but I knew that I would probably whittle it down and then add things to it as I was here. Um, the overall structure that I wanted to follow, though, was to talk about things that I've been hearing about in this group basically since the beginning and where we are, as far as I can tell, on those discussions. So the things that we've talked about. And then I wanted to talk about, and this sounds from Sfeldian, I'm sorry, about the things that we didn't talk about or that we haven't talked about, or that we haven't talked about enough. So that's the broad overview of the structure of this. So I'm going to start off with a lot of the things that we talked about. And when I came here, I sort of had a little bet with myself. I had a stopwatch going. And um, I arrived at the airport, and I arrived here at lunch, and I wanted to know how long it would take before a certain topic was brought up. All right? Um, and I swear, within the first 10 minutes, we had perverse incentives, impact factor, um, author, you know, uh, author charges, um, and of course, um, Elsevier, 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 Elsevier. And so these are things that every time I've come to this conference have been huge topics of conversation, and. Um, and so I wanted to talk about them. And the nice thing was that the first, one of the first panels where we looked back at some of the founders of the organization set up a, a few sub-themes there to talk about. Um, and again, I think these sub-themes have run throughout this conference. And I wanted to pick them up and drill down on them. Um, and the three sub-themes are our uneasy relationship with corporate entities in uh, scholarly communication. The second is what um, was referred to in the, by Jean-Claude in the, in, the, in the panel as the epiphenomena of publishing, right? That is that what we're doing is actually, and a lot of the things that we're obsessing about are side effects of something bigger. And, that, and his point and the thing I'll be talking about is that sometimes we lose track of the fact that what we're dealing with is sometimes side effects. And the last thing is, who do we blame? Right? Because this is really important and is a subject of a lot of the conversations. So let's first talk about this issue of our unease with corporate aspects of, um, of, of scholarly communication. And the first thing is that there's sort of a general anti-corporatism, right? I think we all recognize that, this idea that somehow Maybe this isn't a place where commercial players should be at all. And, and within that, right, there's a bizarre sort of like split personality or dichotomy. We're of two minds, right? Because on the one hand, um, we're very suspicious of the profit motive and whether it can coexist with the, with the norms of, of scholarship, um, the Mertonian norms, whichever norms you want. Um, in an easy, you know, in an easy way. That's a, 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 a very big concern. Um, but we also bizarrely have adopted what we think are a lot of practices that, you know, come from business for, you know, evaluating the people who work in our industry. So we've adopted all sorts of kind of bizarre metrics and KPIs and things like that from the business world, um, except that I'd maintain it's the business world of about 50 years ago. Um, and we use these routinely. So we've got this sort of hyper-corporatism in the way that we're evaluating research and, 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 and the outputs and things like that from our, from our community. But at the same time, we're kind of deeply suspicious of the whole uh, corporate, uh, uh, you know, identity. And one of the things that we also do, I think, and I've seen this repeatedly here, is we're very fast and loose with our vocabulary when we talk about commercial versus non-commercial, charities, non-profits, all of these things. And I think we make a lot of assumptions about what being a non-profit means. Um, 
and whether or not it protects or makes a sort of an organization immune from some of the drivers that can cause problems in, 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 when, they, when they participate in the scholarly community. And, you know, and, and so for just as an example, I will point out, you know, we've had conversations where people here have said, we should not allow for-profit organizations to be playing in this space. And at the same time, in the same session, had people pointing out that some of the sort of worst players, as far as we're concerned, are nonprofit societies and others, right? That, so being nonprofit or for profit is not what guarantees that you're going to play by the rules and accept and adopt the norms of, the org, of, 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 of academia. That's, that's not it. Um, and likewise, we do other things, like for instance, we assume that nonprofit means non-surplus. And that is also not true. I mean, you can have a nonprofit that doesn't have a surplus, but it isn't going to last long. It's going to go down the tubes rather quickly. You need a surplus. Any or healthy organization needs a surplus. And so the question then becomes, what kind, what size of surplus is acceptable to our community? What kind of, you know, is there a limit that we see on what kind of surplus can be raised and what the surplus is used for? And here I'm going to say something probably quite controversial. Um, but I think it's true, and I've, I've spoken to enough people here who have sort of echoed uh, this sentiment. It is not inconceivable to me that an organization, commercial organization, for profit commercial organization, can do something that the academic community cannot do with a 40% profit and still do it cheaper and more efficiently than the academic community. Now that's weird, but I have sat in meetings in universities. I have seen half of a department that was absolutely doing nothing in a university or that was doing stuff that was not central to the core mission of the university. I've seen some of the inefficiencies that exist. Now, I'm not saying, and I please do not misinterpret this as my saying that there is some sort of magic neoliberal thing that makes corporations efficient and, non, and, and for profit corporations efficient and not for profit organizations inefficient. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think that there are temperamental aspects of organizations, governance aspects of organization, structural aspects of organizations that lead some organizations to optimize and to become much more efficient and to deliver things and to be good at certain tasks and other organizations that are more deliberative, that are more consensual, that do not move as fast and that are naturally less efficient for some things. And that's not, that's not bad, it's just that they have different skill sets. But the thing that I've seen is that that does not map necessarily to for-profit commercial, not-for-profit, um, or charity or anything like that. Um, and this is, you know, a constant source of surprise to me. I've seen incredibly efficient, um, entrepreneurial um, nonprofits. And I've seen incredibly inefficient, horrible, bureaucratic for-profits. But this is, an, this is an important thing because one of the things that we keep doing, right, and I think that this is, I mean, I understand it, and I'm definitely sympathetic with it, but when we see a commercial organization making a profit doing something in this space, it does not necessarily mean that if we did it, that profit would go back into the organization, right? Because if we could not do it as efficiently, if we could not do it as well, there is no profit to go back in the organization, right? So it's not, I don't know what the term is, it's not opportunity cost, we have a finance person here. What is it when you see a profit you think that could be mine, except that you're not capable of actually making it? And this is a, this is a case in a lot of cases. Now, I'm not saying that this justifies it. I, you know, I've written about how important it is to reinvest surpluses in organizations. This is something that our organization does. 
But it isn't, it's, it, it isn't by definition the fact that because somebody generates profit that that is money being taken out of the system. That's an important point. So the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is, well, this you know, idea that we have, sorry, I've got my slide a bit mixed up, this idea that we have that there's just this dichotomy, right? There's sweetness and light, nonprofit or charity, they're different too, um, that you know, is going to automatically harmonize with the values of our, of our, of our communities and that there are for profits that will not do that. This last bit, and I've already alluded to this, is this notion that somehow, in order to prove ourselves, right, in order to prove ourselves worthy in the academic community, we have to adopt what we believe to be the kinds of metrics and tools for evaluating, um, for evaluating our, our staff and, and so on and so forth that companies do, right? Um, and this one, I think, is a particularly pernicious one because a lot of the kinds of things that we do, sort of, you know, promoting competition and so on and so forth, um, aren't things that, 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 that commercial organizations would do. So I'm going to take a slight detour now. And I'm going to talk about sort of some of the epiphenomenon aspects of our industry. And again, what Jean-Claude, I think, was alluding to was the fact that there are things that we do, right? There are trade-offs that we make in this industry um, because we're doing it tactically. So, for example, a lot of open access publishers have experimented with either different business models, who do they charge, how do they charge them, different review models, right? Do they do full peer review? Do they do technical reviews? Combi a few combinations of those, but not many combinations of those. What they tend to do is change one variable and then keep the others, right? We're going to do pretty traditional publishing, but we're going to change this um, in order to prove that that is not essential uh, to the publishing process. And, um, and so what happens is they adopt a lot of the sort of trappings of traditional publishing. We adopt a lot of the trappings of traditional publishing. And once we've proven that we can change this one variable and we've changed it, we don't necessarily go back and examine the other things that could be changed. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to sort of highlight, which is true throughout the industry, but somehow it feels more wrong in this community is our use of the word disseminate, which kind of drives me nuts, because it has this sort of broadcast aspect to it. This notion that if you spread it as far as possible, right, that that in and of itself is a good thing, as opposed to maybe communicate, right, where there's an exchange of information, where there's a conversation going on. The one seems a heck of a lot more sort of pushing stuff out, whereas the other is interactive. And one of the reasons that I'm concerned about this is because if you look at the way that we <coughs> talk about the value that we're providing, right, we'll often say things like scientists or scholars uh, communicate through publishing, right? But again, if I go to each of you and I say, how much scientific, actual scientific communication occurs through the published journal as opposed to other means, like sitting in a bar or talking to each other in a lab or exchanging information on Slack or Mendeley or something like that, my guess is you'd say that, you know what? The bulk of actual scientific communication does not necessarily happen at the publication level. A lot of it is happening way before that. And this becomes really important because what we're doing is we're focusing on that end bit. <coughs> and that end bit we've also weaponized by making it a mechanism for rewarding people. Right? We've turned publication itself into an indicator of whether or not you're doing well. And I think that this itself 
starts to become a problem. We, we, we have effectively said communicating is a measure of whether or not you are doing well. And we built a whole bunch of metrics based on this. Um, and one of the things that we have is we have this sort of avalanche, I mean this bizarre funnel where we've got tons of people in early career writing and so on and so forth and this huge amount of pressure on people to communicate, to write, so that they can advance their careers in a system where there are fewer and fewer opportunities as you go along, right? And our answer to this, right, this is the thing you see. You see this kind of phrase. This competition is good. It weeds out the weak. It identifies the strong, you know? And, and, and the people who say this, I tend to find, think that this is the way businesses think. That, you know, this is like, this is just hard business sense. Very few businesses operate this way. And this is actually a quote here. If you bought into that, and I doubt any of the, anybody here has, but I've heard many people buy into that. That this intense competition, that this pressure cooker, is the key to generating creativity. Now, I don't know about you, but tons of pressure does not make me intensely creative, right? But this is kind of what we've done. We've just created a pressure cooker environment for research. And we expect that this is going to benefit, that, that this is going to benefit the enterprise. And, and this, to me, is weird. Um, you know, this is the... <laughs> logical next step, right? <laughs> Anybody recognize this icon? Right. How many people here use Slack? Okay. So I suggest when you go back, to work, you bring up a new program where you rank employees in your organization by the number of times they message. <laughs> right? Because communication is good. Business communication is really important. It's vital. Why aren't you ranking people according to the number of times that they slack? All right, well, we can refine it because clearly that's a gross sort of thing. But how about the number of times that they slack and engage someone else who also slacks a lot, right? That would be a little better, right? Because that's sort of like the, you know, you know, like citation, right? It's showing impact, right? None of us would do this. It would be absolutely mad. And yet we do this in this industry. This baffles me. I have no idea why we do this. And this, of course, leads to another topic. Something that I've written about and talked about elsewhere in more detail, but it's what I call the citation fetish. And no, I don't mean that kind of fetish, I mean this kind of fetish. Where we imbue something with magical properties, magical capabilities, that it doesn't necessarily have, and we obsess about it, thinking that it has those capabilities. And we have this weird thing, because publication, is such an important part of getting promoted. And because publications that are cited are supposed to be a sign of impact, one of the things that I see going on that I think is one of the most pernicious things undermining our industry is that citation, which performs a number of functions in the scholarly record, <coughs> is being co-opted and focused on one function, which is credit. Now, citations do a lot of things. If you look at, you know, just one of the very early articles by Eugene Garfield, he identifies a whole list of things that citations do. And some of them are quite bizarre, but when you look at them, you think, yeah, that's true. I've seen citations that are doing this, right? That are just advertising something that's coming up or making something known or counting an argument. But look at this. Almost all of the red ones, have to do with credit, right? But citations play a very important other role. They point to evidence, right? They point to previous arguments. They point to data. They point increasingly to software. And I would maintain that the tilt of citations towards credit is 
utterly distorting what they're used for. And you see this all the time. You see Force 11 if you're talking about their principles, right? Second one is credit and attribution. Third one is evidence. Now, they say that the order doesn't matter, but man, they picked an order, and evidence wasn't first. <laughs> Think share, credit for all your research, right? Not the bloody data you need in order to understand the thing, it's the credit. Um, look at uh, the software credit workshop, right? Software vital for being able to reproduce some of the research, and what are they focused on uh, is credit and contribution. Um, making your code citable, GitHub for science, you know, but also getting required academic credit is even better. Um, citation, Wikipedia, several purposes, uphold intellectual honesty, avoiding plagiarism, that's an, yeah, I mean, I suppose so, um, to determine independently whether it supports the author's argument. So that's second. So attribute prior or unoriginal work. Um, and we can go on. Dora. The word evidence doesn't even appear in this statement, but the word credit does. Now, there's this sort of, I don't know whether you've seen this, this fake TED talk, where they, you know, they, they do a, a, a spoof of a TED talk. And one of the things that somebody always does in TED, TED talks is they show a picture of the planet Earth, right? <laughs> and, you know, to talk about global things. I'm going to one-up this. I'm going to give you two planets. <laughs> Imagine a planet where you try to conduct science and you could say, who said something? But you didn't point to it. You didn't point to the evidence. And imagine another planet where you could point to the evidence, but you didn't necessarily say who said it. You couldn't say who said it. Where would science still function? I'm not saying science career. I'm saying where would science still function? It's the second planet. You could make the case that one of the best ways to repair scholarly communication would be to make it pseudo anonymous. So I talk about this incessantly in a few other things, and I'm going to move on. Next thing is really important, blame. Who do we blame? This conversation happens in one form or another uh, in, this, uh, in this forum. And, um, and you know what? If I were an alien and I came and I landed and I came to a conference like this, I'd be so confused. Because I'd be hearing people talking about authors and readers as if they were different people, right? They're researchers. And they have this incredible split personality where everything that an author does makes a reader's life miserable. <laughs> We've got this thing where we're like, okay, well, who's responsible for this mess? You know, we blame the institutions for putting pressure on the researchers. The institutions blame the funders because they won't get the funding if they don't have the right, you know, profile. The funders are, you know, and this, this is, we see this all the time. Uh, there's, and then finally, everybody can agree that, right, <laughs> but there's a slight modification of this, right? The science, right? In this, in some of the talks, today. but here's the question: I just want to ask, how many people in this audience were once or are currently a researcher? That's what I'm sorry. That's what I thought. Here's a certain dirty secret about this picture, right? <laughs> Funders are being advised by researchers. The institutions are being advised and run by researchers. It's researchers all the way down. That's one of the big problems. And I know you all recognize this. You've known this, right? Is that you've got to convince the researchers. They're the ones, I mean, this, I mean, I described this. It's sort of like, you know, if, if, if I were sitting here and hitting myself with a boxing glove, you know, and shouting regular boxing gloves, um, Please make me wear a helmet. Do all the, you know, the answer is stop hitting yourself in the face. <laughs> um, we really have to figure out how to get this across to, 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 to the rest of the community that so much of this work, so much of the problem, so much of the dysfunction is self-inflicted. All right, so all of these topics have been things that we've talked about a lot in the past. I'm finally going to move on to the last bit, which is stuff that at least in past meetings that I came to were not talked about. It used to drive me a bit crazy. But thankfully, yesterday, the people started really talking about this, in particular, Mr. McCann, 
started talking about the importance of infrastructure in our industry. And this is the main takeaway that I have. In some ways, and again, John claude talked about this, he said, we are looking in a rear view mirror. In many ways, we're addressing the issues that have gone by. <coughs> the plan S is informed. Things are advancing here. What is changing? And what's changing is that a lot of smart people have realized what we talked about before, that scholarly communication, the bulk of it, does not happen in the published journal article. It happens way before that. It happens in small groups. It happens in research groups. It happens in bars. It happens in social networks. It happens on Slack or whatever you're using. That's the equivalent of Slack, right? This is infrastructure, communication infrastructure that we use that we're hardly aware of. And the threat we have is that everything that we gain in open access could become enclosed if all the activities of researchers start happening behind closed doors and we're stuck with the outputs at the end which are now open but we have no idea about what the real conversation were how people were interacting with each other, what they were doing. <laughs> and so we're focusing on this. We keep talking about publishing, right? And this is the point of the epiphenomenon. Publishing, you know, it's, it was a way of communicating. It might still be a way of communicating in lots of places. But let's face it, if we could improve the system, we would. We just hook up brains, right? That would be the best way to communicate. There would be no extra step. We'd just be able to subscribe to someone's brain. We'd be able to do as close to that as possible. And this is what we're aiming for, right? And this is kind of what's happening. When you see some of these little, you know, social networks, research groups, whether it's short-term research groups that form and break up because they're reviewing an article, or longer-term research groups that are using Slack or Mendeley or ResearchGate or something like that to collaborate, What's happening is that these people are being able to communicate in this form, and the amazing thing is that the people who are connecting them are able to watch and measure it and understand how they're working together and see what's coming down the line. So this is just an extension of the surveillance capitalism that we all know and love and have been part of now for all, close to a decade, except that we're looking at the research. And one of the problems here, and this might be a very efficient way of communicating, it might be a very important way of communicating, um, I and mean, surely is all of these things. But if this data, if the information about how this happens does not belong to the community, we're going to be blind to how research is actually working. And then we're going to be in a worse condition, or at least as bad a condition, as if we didn't have the final outputs from that research. Everything we don't gain by opening content, we could lose if we do not have mechanisms for making sure that these organizations that are running these things are adhering to the rules and norms of our community. That they're making the data about the research process available so that it can be looked at, evaluated, tested, all of the things that researchers like to do. I just want to do something very quickly because I know I'm very quickly running out of time. I want to talk about some of the, 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 the solutions that are proposed often to this dilemma, right? To the centralization, that's sort of the demon, right? The centralizing stuff, a few big players are taking over stuff. Again, I don't think it's a question of a few big players taking over. So that's not the issue. If they play by our norms, if they adhere to our rules, I don't really care too much how big they are. I do care that they respect what we're doing and that they make the data about the process so, But there's this thing that happened in technology and elsewhere. I call it the angry salad syndrome. <laughs> Where there are a lot of words that you love to use, right? It's like, like if you go to a restaurant in the, in the US, um, they do two tricks. One is they take healthy ingredients and they put something in front of it to make it sound tasty, right? Like, you know, honey roast salmon, right? Um, and, um, or, 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 or they'll add a, a suffix to something to make it sound healthy. You know, potato salad, <laughs> roast beef salad, pasta salad, right? We do something in the tech community 
right? Which is we take words like this and we can string them together and make almost anything sound good. <laughs> Let's say I were to propose to you a user-centric, web-scale, open enterprise fabric for digital rights management. <laughs> It almost sounds plausible. <laughs> and we see this time and time again when we're talking about how are we going to solve this issue. We're going to create a distributed, you know, we're going to just create a distributed fabric of pods, research pods, that are going to automatically interact with each other. The problem here is that these are actually, when these words are employed, they're rarely actually about the technology. What they are is you have this awkward situation where you've got a lot of researchers, a lot of institutions, and those institutions get a lot of money. And the minute you talk about centralizing something, the threat is that some of that money goes to the central service. And so the automatic knee-jerk reaction is we're going to distribute it. We're going to federate it. But one of the biggest problems with this pattern is that, <laughs> I gave away a lot, um, is that distribution begets, I mean, distribution begets centralization. Right? We have all of these things like you know, the blockchain and people are talking about research pods and stuff like that. The problem is we've had this before when we have distributed systems. One of the biggest problems with them is that they represent a subset of the community that we're uh, interested in. They usually don't have enough funds to make the systems really usable or workable. And so what happens is a third party comes in, puts a layer on top, makes it usable, makes it friendly, and we all flock to that. Right? That's what happened with the web. It's what's happened with email. It's, what hap it's what's happened with virtually every distributed communication system we've created. And I, 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 I ask all the time, somebody, please give me a counterexample of this. Because I cannot find a counterexample of this. Always the same thing happens. And I don't think it can be solved through technology. I think it can be solved through government. I think it can be solved if we recognize this pattern ourselves and do something. If we are the people who create, for example, the data set search engine that we did not create and that has now been created by Google. These are the things that we have to anticipate and that we have to invest in and that we have to take control of or that we at least have to define rules around so that when commercial parties come in and do something, they're doing it in a way that's compatible with what, with our long-term goals. And I'll point out in this article, again, um, this work that Spark is doing, one of the other things that they don't mention in this that's a benefit is that if we set out rules about how commercial players can play in this space, make as much profit as they want, as long as they don't walk us in and do a whole bunch of other things, what we're actually doing is we're actually improving the investment climate for lots of startups who otherwise face a very risky future, right? If they're trying to invest in this space, they're like, well, I don't know. I mean, if I do something and I suddenly start making money, everybody's going to hate me, and there are things that I might do that are absolutely... But if we lay down the ground and say, look, here are the things you can't do. You can't lock up research data. You can't force people to move in. You can't make whatever these rules are, right? Then all of a sudden that makes it easier for them to say, okay, here's a place where I can add value, and I can and I know what the risks are, and I can actually with some you know form of confidence predict whether or not I'm going to be able to succeed in this space. So distributed to get centralized. Let's accept this. Let's create the rules that allow the centralization to occur, but that allow us to control it. So again, back to the panel. This panel defined all of these sort of things very early on. They've been brought up in one form or another throughout the day. And I hope, and I, I, I actually believe, I've seen enough evidence, things like the COCO Foundation, which is now building infrastructure for the, you know, that, that's going to be widely used in our industry, that's open source, that's in, you know, that's, that, that, that the community is controlling. Some of the stuff that Spark is doing to try and figure out whether there are rules, procurement rules, something that can guide organizations who are playing in this space. This gives me hope. This gives me a sense that maybe when we meet in five years, there's going to be an explosion of experimentation, of development in this area. That's not going to be on the old pattern, where it was always a side project that was you know, funded on short-term money, and then when it goes down to two, where the funding goes. 
but that has some sort of permanence and that we can rely on. What I don't think we should be doing, right, is just accelerating sort of the old ways of doing things. We can't be like attaching, you know, and this is, this is what we've kind of been doing in a lot of cases. We've got to think beyond the traditions, not just speed it up, but actually change it. Um, and again, I hope in five years when we have another birthday party, we're able to see a lot of progress on this. Uh, happy birthday, Nicole Asp, and uh, thank you all very much. Yeah, thanks for an interesting um, talk. Um, I'd just like to take issue a little bit with the, uh, the idea that we can get rid of, uh, of rewarding researchers uh, for their research output. Um, if you go back to the beginning of, of publishing, uh, before you had journals, uh, you had researchers uh, putting out like cryptic messages about, about their latest findings. So essentially, they could kind of reveal uh, what they'd found when their competitors uh, found the same thing. Um, and immediately, well, one of the kind of motivations for journals was to uh, give a, uh, a kind of credit and um, uh, prestige uh, around making research public. So I completely agree that the way that researchers are, are recognised for their, for their work needs to change, but there needs to be some kind of credit given to researchers for, for making things public, and this probably applies to data as well. you know, um, with, with Martin Fenner or something like that, could just automatically be transcribed and made public so that, you know, well, not all of it, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, you know, I mean, that's the thing, it, it, that it doesn't take overhead, right? And that is where a lot of the communication has, and de facto it's taking pr place privately now, right? Um, but that's, but that's, that's an accident of, I mean, that's, you know, that's changing with technology. I mean, the, the original Dora... Um, you know, uh, I mean, sorry, the Budapest, you know, technology is changing the way, the, the possibilities. That information can be captured. Certainly, a lot of uh, people in this industry have realized that, and they're doing it now, right? Um, but if it is private, that is a problem. I, I completely agree with you. Um, sorry? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so in your talk, you at least suggested that you think that in the not so distant future, publications, if they're not in formal publications, might not go away, but they're not going to be the thing that is most important. Um, on what timescales do you imagine that formal publication is going to become relatively unimportant? Um, well, well, I mean, I so, uh, the trick here, of course, is defining publication, right? Because we have this unbelievable lo we long well, chain. The journal article. Peer well, yeah, journal the peer-reviewed journal article, they quote as a, say, version of record. Um, I think it's already becoming a lot less important. I think somebody used the phrase here, um, the record of versions. And in an article that I wrote with Cameron and Jennifer and Damien, we talked about um, the uh, version with the record of what's been doing, uh, what's, because people give different values to some of the things that happen, right? At different stages of their career, at different stages of the, of the process. And so I think that there's just gonna be a larger continuum between sort of rough drafts to, you know, the so-called final version, which never is final, um, and, and, and how people use those, and an acceptance of that. Um, the time scale, I mean, it, you know, look at physics, it's happened. Um, and in other industries, it could happen quickly. I don't know. It's, a, it's largely generational. I'm terrible at predicting timescales for this. So. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I largely agree with you, but aren't you talking to the wrong audience? I mean, we are the publishers, and we're just taking advantage of the problems of the system. And you should talk to the institutions and the funders. 
and the researchers. Okay, I'm happy to hear. So, um, people will know um, that I'm in a rare position where I don't depend on funding or funders, and uh, I routinely go and 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 and, and talk to them <laughs> gently and say, "You have to." I mean, because this really is the 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 the, the the thing that is the silliest, right? Funders claim they don't fund infrastructure. They do, they just do a crap job of it, right? Um, every, everybody here who's ever applied for a grant has applied for a grant thinking, I'm gonna use this bit of the grant to prop up this thing that I did ages ago, and this other bit to do something new um, that I wanna do, but I'm making it look like something they wanted me to do, right? I mean, we know this trick. Everybody has played this thing. And so funders are funding infrastructure, they're just doing it piecemeal and horribly. And if we ran the lights the way that we run scholarly infrastructure, you know, every four years we'd be like, oh my God, we gotta run around and get a new grant because the lights are gonna go out. That's not, that's not a stable infrastructure, right? Um, so I tell them this as often as I can. Okay. Well then, please uh, join me in thanking Jeffrey.